it's a short session and people have a lot to say. These people have a lot to say. So um, we're going to get going a bit. So I have some intro slides um, about them. All, all four of these folks have influenced me personally in ways that were important and which they don't always actually know. Okay. Um, and I won't go into that in detail. There's no point to that. But they're, they're, they're giants in the field. I'm watching them, photo photographing them now for uh, a long time. Sometimes they didn't know that. Um, <laughs> so I've got all these this photographs of them. So uh, a couple, of just I'll go. A couple, of, they're just for fun, basically. You can see them then and now as, as well as best I could do. Um, that's the first conference, 1972 Hong Kong. I've got several photos from somebody for that conference, and it was quite. I guess I, I wasn't there, but um, it, it was. Of course, it was. The, it was the beginning. It was the start of things. And that's John, also an older photograph, uh, some years ago. That's about two decades. Yeah. So uh, that was in Xi'an, China, a conference there. Uh, Peter Smith. We used to do the Meet the Seniors events um, versus Meet the Elders, Meet the Seniors events various people, and this is one he was doing for us in uh, Xi'an, Xi'an, China also. <coughs> uh, this was taken by me. I don't have a date, but it was kind of interesting. Remember, this is hear no evil, say no evil, <laughs> that, that uh, old thing. <laughs> so they are being uh, funny. Uh, first photo of Michael Bond, a long time ago. I was actually living in Taiwan at the time and got this photograph of him. He used to smoke a pipe. Where is the pipe? Okay, and of course the, is that a, that's a telephone, okay, okay. Um, uh, again, in Xi'an, China, receiving the Honorary Fellows Award at that time. Um, they're all fellows, but he, I guess had this photograph. Um, and uh, the famous uh, Brayman dance face-off uh, against Chuck Hill, who's not here this time, so that was funny. Last but not least, That was actually pretty heated beyond what you saw there. So anyway, um, this I came across, I have this archive. Um, so Peter Smith, he was president in Xi'an. He showed this slide giving an address. Um, he was quoting Jerome Bruner from 72, way back. And if you'll read that, it's quite touching. So he was thinking by, by 1974, we'd have, have to figure it out. No sweat. Okay. <laughs> Optimism. <coughs> so we, we posed questions to all, all four of the, four of four of our um, elders here, and we asked them to pick some questions to answer. The idea basically here is that they each chose an a, a question to address specifically themselves, and then we'll have. The, I'll give them eight minutes. Where the, who's got that? You've got it. Okay. Eight minutes um, each, which is not much time for these complex questions. Open up then to the whole audience to, to ask questions of them. We'll, we'll take turns answering questions. Uh, it could be these questions, other questions that have been posed more recently, and so on. So if this, is, this is a new thing. There's no model for this, really. This is the best we could do with an ad hoc structure. So we'll see how it goes, basically. So um, I'm sure it'll be very interesting. Uh, finally, um, to, to lift, lift the mood, um, uh, so this is the, these are the eight minutes, okay, uh, alphabetical. We have um, this uh, um, <laughs> art museum piece here, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, anyway, um, okay, so John Barry was first. Um, so you have the microphone there. So um, maybe you can s state the question. They won't recall what it was. Then you can give your, um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Bill, and thank you, everybody, for coming uh, towards the end of the conference. I know everybody's a bit tired, 
but this is an opportunity for us to reflect back and look forward on the history of this association. Let me start by saying the obvious. Uh, the four of us up here uh, do not represent all of the elders of the association. Uh, we are the ones who were available uh, by announcing that we were coming uh, to this conference. There are other elders who are living who could not be here. Walt Lawner, with whom I share the uh, record for having been to all international conferences of the association. Um, Patricia Greenfield, uh, <coughs> Marshall Siegel, uh, Ron Taft of Melbourne, Janik Pandey of India, and I think those are the available living uh, elders. But we also have to acknowledge the contributions of elders who have passed away. Uh, Harry Triandis, one of the founders. Gustav Yehoda, who was the second president. Jerry Bruner, who was in first president, not the second. Uh, Michael Durajai of Nigeria. And of course, Chidam Kachibasi from Turkey, who made uh, a tremendous contribution to the development of the association. So I'd like to pay tribute to all of these people who are no longer with us and who could well have been here uh, giving their perspectives. So I'm going to start as a Calvinist with a biblical quote. In the beginning was the word. And that word was ethnocentrism. In 1970s and in the decade before that, we were living, researching, and teaching a psychology that was highly ethnocentric. It was both culture-bound in that it was limited to ideas and evidence from a very small corner of the world. It was also culture-bound, sorry, culture-blind, because it did not take seriously the possible role of perhaps the biggest contributor to human development ontogenetically, and that is the cultural systems within which we grow up. So in answer to the question, what did we think we were doing back then? It was to reduce the ethnocentrism of the discipline, to essentially challenge what I then still call WASP, Western academic scientific psychology that dominated almost everything that we were doing at the time. We were products of this time, and we recognize that, but we also wanted to distance ourselves uh, from that time. So what we did was to create an organization, this organization 50 years ago, to bring together like-minded folks who were available, identifiable from published literature, to hold an inaugural conference in Hong Kong, as you saw some pictures, under the coordination and leadership of John Dawson, uh, an Australian, who uh, was then professor of psychology at the University of Hong Kong. Now, I think we have been largely successful in challenging WASP. I think psychology now recognizes culture as an important factor in how we grow up and behave. And we also increase the range of ideas and samples that we have incorporated into the discipline. But in many respects, this success is also the problem. As we heard this morning, for example, in the discussion after the lecture on racism and at other times during this conference, we have not gone far enough. There is a wave, a second wave, the first wave of the first 50 years with some success behind us. The second wave is now more challenging, more critical, demanding more anti-colonial perspectives, more indigenous perspectives. And I think this is the wave of the future. And I personally am happy to stand aside 
and let that wave take over uh, from where we have left off. And I leave it to the leadership of your new president, my former student, uh, Zainab, who I look forward to uh, seeing in action over the next few years. Thank you very much. Why not waste uh, maybe one question? We've got a few minutes left. Um, just one question, I think, at this point for, for John specifically. Speechless. Okay. All right. Okay. So, Michael. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here, for sustaining the association, which some of us helped to establish, initiate, I guess I would say. I stand in your shadow, John, in that regard. I did not attend the 1972 conference, although I could have. I didn't really know enough about cross-cultural uh, at that time. But whatever, whatever salvo you released into the world is sitting before us. Um, you are they um, uh, who have found sufficient inspiration in the uh, the association and what it represents to be here today. And many of you have been sustaining this association as we have dropped back to do the various things that we learned how to do well uh, at that time, dealing with the constraints and the affordances that we faced so we are representatives of the dinosaurian era before the uh, meteor hit the Yucatan Peninsula. I, I mean, it's a kind of metaphor, right? A kind of analogy. Uh, and I am agog uh, as I listen to the kind of challenge and reality that you face and which I hear about from you in conversations uh, as you face a future wondering where you can implant your commitment to uh, the reality and the, uh, the pressure of our cultural background into your lives, how you can incorporate this into a 21st century uh, reality, the emergence from the dinosaur era into whatever the next uh, era was. Uh, and uh, I frequently use the expression uh, with you guys in conversation that um, I'm from then, you're from now, and I'm extremely sympathetic uh, to the realities that you guys face and I want to learn about those realities and I'm sincerely questioning what we up here can do to contribute to what you might be able to carry forward and I do want not to speak for eight minutes I do want to provoke a discussion. I do want you guys asking questions which, of course, must, as sincere questions, reflect the reality that you're confronting. We confronted a reality, and we survived it, and we're here in front of you. What do we have for you guys? What is the wisdom of the elders that goes beyond questions of how we survived and are still here in place that is going to be useful to you. As I face the rest of my life, my question is, how am I still useful? How can I still be useful? But that's really all I wanted to do in the world, I think, if I look back over the trajectory. Is 
to be useful. And I was useful because I wouldn't be here if I hadn't been useful and got to this stage. But you guys are facing a different world, a, a daunting world. Um, certainly those of you who heard the talk this morning, wow, how are you going to accommodate that into your lives? How, how are you going to take this upon yourself with all the equipment and the background that we have provided, some of us have provided, uh, along with uh, the others who are not here um, and who will never be represented into your future. So, guys, I want to hear from you, okay? This is your world. This is, this is your creation. In the same way that the early days of the association was our creation. And you guys know I'm in love with the sound of literature and English literature. And I give you a quote from a poem by Tennyson called The Mort Arteur. The old order changeth, giving place to new. And God reveals himself in many ways, lest one old custom corrupt the new. Now, you don't have to believe in God or the existence of a God in order to understand what he's talking about, that the emergence has happened, and that's what you face. We have faced it uh, and accommodated as best we can. Over to you. What you going to do? Are you going to take up the challenge? Did you lose all hope this morning? I've already spoken for six minutes. We're geniuses at occupying space and time, and <laughs> so I, I pass the cudgel <laughs> to you. I just. I just learned from Michael that we shouldn't be here, but we are here, so I better continue. What's <laughs> we, the world telling us? <laughs> you know, the, um, there's one thing which, uh, which is, I think, very relevant. And should I be close at this? Okay. There's one thing which is sort of very relevant, uh, a, a big question, and that is what that science should be relevant, societally relevant. And if uh, there's one thing standing out in this conference, to me, it is that we had keynotes which really underwrote that point, which really emphasized that point on poverty, on racism. So, my compliments. At the same time, I'm asking myself, does this amount to a shift in orientation in IACCP, the International Association for Cross-Cultural Psychology, as a field of science. You know, science is characterized by theories and methods. And as cross-cultural psychology, we have always tried to sort of behavior, to see behavior in a global perspective. But we were, to a large extent, and maybe I'm speaking too much for too much for myself here, about theory and method and data collection in a sort of systematic way and questions about generalizability of our findings. And I, I must say that I'm not ashamed of that. And if you look at the broader perspective, then we can say, you know, that uh, we got our script from the Phoenicians and our mathematics from the Arabs, sort of, you know, with, by and large. And the bridges which are built today in South America are based on the principles of engineering which are figured out in Western Europe and Britain particularly in, let's say, the 18th or 19th century. Now, is there something in our theories and method which we can put on the table and which are there for others in Africa, in East Asia, 
everywhere where we still think that cross-cultural psychology may have to be developed or should be developed further and where these things, these methods, these theories can be profitable, not in the sense of established truth, but as platforms for launching your own research. And that, I think, is something which I would like to sort of propose to you that this is an element which, uh, which we should not forget about it. Cross International Association for Cross-Cultural Psychology has always been trying to be very inclusive. Uh, I organized the conference in Tilburg in 1976, and I had taken the lead from John Barry and others that we should give out many travel grants as much as we could. The participants, particularly the Western participants, complained about the quality of the food, and not, <laughs> not entirely without reason, I, I think. <laughs> and, uh, but we had a massive amount of Indian psychologists there. And, uh, and you know, they, uh, they traveled basically on, uh, on the quality of the food, if I may say so. And I have never regretted that. It, ICCP is sort of skewed if you look at four old gentlemen and the leading ladies are sitting in the, uh, in the audience. This was a development. When ladies started to r ring the bell, we in Munich at the spur of the moment, made four positions on the executive committee available to, uh, to women. There had been, uh, been another lady already from India, Ananda Lakshmi, who had been on the executive committee, but I mean, it was an all-male affair at that moment. But, but it was not that we were not open to it. It was just a kind of a state of affairs which existed at that time. Psychology was still predominantly a male profession. Can you imagine that today? <laughs> and so it, it, it is difficult to sort of anticipate the directions in which you should move to sort of realize the ethical and social responsibilities which we all think we should have and which we, I admit and I apologize, have taken insufficiently. Still, it doesn't mean that there is no space for scientific method and scientific theory on a plate for you to make use of it and to say also how that was wrong and improve on it. Thank you. I find this panel a wonderful opportunity for me to feel young while being old. I see my three colleagues sitting here. Now, I have only been involved in this association for 33 years, so I'm young. I, th they have all been involved substantially more than that. Because I'm younger and more junior, I have taken the briefing for this session more literally and more precisely. I was asked a question and I proposed to answer it. <laughs> is there any single problem in cross-cultural methodology that is most critical in holding back theoretical progress? Well, I would say my answer to that is the debate about measurement equivalence. We have enormous difficulties that we face in establishing the equivalence of any kind of measure that we use as soon as we start sampling from large numbers of cultural groups. But if we don't sample from large numbers of cultural groups, we can't answer any of the questions that are important to our field. Now, the particular issue that I get burned up about is the distinction between looking at individual level data and sample level data. There have been several symposia in this conference focused on measurement equivalence 
And I am very much in sympathy with what I imagine was presented, although I haven't been to any of these symposia, about the importance of establishing indie level, individual level equivalence between measures taken from different cultural groups. But what I'm especially bothered about is our difficulty in talking about the equivalence of dimensions uh, that characterize the difference between cultures, not the difference between individuals. That is a problem for us getting papers accepted in major journals, but it is also a problem within our community. The issue that arises is one of how to address, can you look at the next slide please, Bill? Um, the ecological fallacy. If we try to classify cultures in terms of variables that are derived from individual level measures, we then find discussion about how valid is it to do that. And the issue which has been at the forefront of my mind is that when there are errors at the sample level, we often find that the dimensions that we use are criticized as invalid. The definition of a culture has to do not with measurement equivalence or measurement inequivalence, it has to do with the frequency with which people in a given culture behave or act or think in ways that are similar to each other. And I want to illustrate the point that it doesn't matter whether measurements are valid or invalid at the cultural level. If you want to define a cultural dimension, you simply know, need to know how many people there are in a population who think or act in a particular way. And I want to illustrate that by looking at the question of acquiescent responding. I've been focused on that for 20 or more years. Next slide, Bill. How many people strongly agree with lots and lots of questions in the World Value Survey? In some countries, lots and lots of people say that they strongly agree with numerous items. The countries listed on the left there, there are something like 50 or 60 percent of people who say they strongly agree with various different questions, none of which are substantially related to each other. The countries on the left, on the right hand side, only 30 or 40 percent say they strongly agree with those items. That's a measurement error, isn't it? No, it isn't. It's showing that there are, in certain countries, people who think and act and fill in questionnaires in similar ways. We can define dimensions on the basis of similarity of that kind. And if you do that, you find that the frequent, and, and it's not anything to do with individualism and collectivism. Look at those countries on the right hand side. The Netherlands, Singapore, China, Japan, and Switzerland. What do they have in common with each other? Not individualism versus collectivism. What they have in common with each other is they match up with the dimension most recently identified by Michel Minkoff, which he calls monumentalism versus flexibility. In flexible cultures, people don't stick their neck out. In monumentalist cultures, people assert themselves very strongly. So that's a dimension characterized among many other things by the fact that people agree with each other more often or less often. And if you look at objective indices to try and defend, define the nature of that dimension, you find that the, the right-hand column, those are cultural groups which value achievement and score much higher on their gross savings. You find that the nations on the left-hand side, and I'm talking, of course, about 85 different nations, those are just examples of extreme scoring nations, are much higher on crime and on homicide. These are objective indices and that they show that if you use something which is not an objective index, namely agreeing with a whole lot of questions, 
that can lead you to identify dimensions of cultural variance which are important. And that is something I feel very strongly about. I think my contribution sounds a bit different from those, from these gray-haired old men here, but I wanted to put that into our debate. Thank you. Thank you.